Welcome to the Defense and Airspace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian at Naval Air Station Whidbey Island in the great state of Washington, and we are visiting with uh, Captain uh, Rob Patrick, who is the Commodore of Patrol and Reconnaissance Wing 10. Sir, thanks very much for, uh, for making some time for us. Thank you very much, sir. Happy to be here. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you guys uh, do. You know, what, what is the mission of your wing? So the mission of Patrol and Reconnaissance Wing 10 is to prepare six squadrons, maritime patrol squadrons, P-3 aircraft and P-8 aircraft to deploy. We have two squadrons deployed at all times around the world to conduct anti-submarine warfare missions, anti-surface warfare missions, and intel intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance missions, whatever our country asks for uh, every day around the world. Uh, how many aircraft do you have in total and how many personnel? We have about 2,500 personnel in each squadron, the six squadrons, has uh, about uh, eight air, uh, aircraft. Uh, right now, we have one squ uh, squadron uh, that's transitioning to the P-8 VP-4, and we have one squadron that just moved from Hawaii. It's on deployment, VP-47. The last squadron uh, to move from Hawaii to Whidbey Island, VP-9, will be coming uh, next year after deployment. Walk us through uh, the the transition cycle on that. Obviously, you know the you're a former S three uh, operator. You uh, were a P three operator, and now you're transitioning to the P eight aircraft. Um, walk us through what the timelines are as you guys make that transition. Sure. So uh, we started with VP four. So VP four left Hawaii uh, last spring, went on deployment to uh, the Mediterranean, and they arrived here in September. They started transition in October. They'll finish up transition in six months. At that time, VP-47 will come back from deployment. They will relocate here to Whidbey Island with all their families, and they'll start transition. They'll go through transition for six months, and then VP-9 will transition for six months. After squadron transitions for six months, then they uh, do preparations in the P-8 for deployment. Overall, that's going to look like a year and a half of those three squadrons transitioning. We'll have a six-month break, and then the three squadrons that are permanently stationed here already, VP-1, VP-40, and VP-46, will all transition. So by 2020, we'll have all P-8 squadrons here, and we'll be uh, uh, deploying two squadrons at a time. Uh, obviously, Jacksonville is very important in that transition per period where folks are undergoing some training. Talk to us a little bit about the capabilities difference between what the P-3 is able to deliver, the legendary aircraft that's behind mm -hmm. us that began life as the, as the Lockheed Electra uh, mm -hmm. airliner, but has served for, for decades since the, since the late 50s, early 60s, certainly in that, in that capacity, and what the capabilities of the P-8 are as it comes online. So the P-3 is a, a war horse, it's a workhorse, and it's very reliable, but not without its maintenance issues because it's an old airplane. When I was on deployment with it when I was in EXO, uh, half of the airplanes we had were older than I was, and I was 40 years old. So uh, the P-8, it brings uh, a bigger, a faster, uh, a better uh, comfort environment, environment uh, inside the airplane, and uh, better endurance. And the sensors on board, the processing power for the, uh, the sonar buoys in ASW is all an improvement. Uh, we're going to see with a high altitude ASW that's coming in a couple years, you're going to be able to stay up high. You're going to be able to use your radar horizon, your ESM capability, and still prosecute a submarine. And when people talk about maritime patrol, they should think about our number one priority, which is anti-submarine warfare. We can do other things well, but anti-submarine warfare is our primary mission. You know, on that front, there are so many people that we met um, who, are, who are your troops who say, you know, I spent all my time in Iraq and Afghanistan. The P-3s and the EP-3 force was doing tremendous work there. Uh, pretty much just the ability of having an airplane with long endurance that had a FLIR ball on it could put eyes on targets to do the tracking over a protracted period of time was important. Obviously, that mission was displaced by, the, by a successive series of ever better unmanned systems. But, you know, those folks talk about, you know, I haven't done any submarine warfare for the entire time that I may have been in the Navy as a lieutenant commander. Um, what are some of the challenges 
of growing that capability and improving it. And even the challenges for leaders like you who came in at the after the Cold War was over and not at the height of when you know these aircraft were were prosecuting submarine targets in a way uh, that is you know almost unimaginable today. So that's a great question, and it's very true. Uh, when I started flying off the aircraft carrier in 1996, the, uh, the Cold War was over, and we didn't have the opportunities to do anti-submarine warfare against our adversaries. Well, our adversaries are helping us in that regard because they're giving us real-world opportunities uh, all over the world today uh, to, to practice that skill. And we are changing our training to, uh, to that uh, that tactic to uh, provide our people better opportunities for ASW. Uh, one of the things that the P-8 uh, brings to us is uh, simulation. And so we just started, opened our fleet training center, and uh, our guys are getting, guys and gals, are getting more opportunities in the simulator to do anti-submarine warfare. We just did a, uh, a Comp 2X with the Carl Vinson Strike Group uh, with uh, a bunch of maritime patrol aircraft, U.S., Canadian, and Australian, and we spent a lot of time on top of uh, U.S. submarines practicing that skill. So as, we, as our adversaries present these opportunities, and we understand that we need to get better at it, and we will continue to do that, and the P-8 is just one step uh, to, to make that happen. P-3 was uh, a landmark aircraft in that virtually every one of America's allies were operating P-3s. That gave a baseline community around which to build better uh, maritime patrol and anti-submarine skills. P-8 looks like it's developing along a very, very similar path. Um, Australians um, have the aircraft. Um, the Brits are buying it. The Norwegians are buying it. The Indians have that in inventory. Um, what are some of the things that you're doing with these countries to sort of fuse, bring lessons learned, and, and create a uh, and a, 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 a perhaps a coalition approach to future anti-submarine warfare. So two of my instructors when I was in Jacksonville recently were an Australian and a British officer. They trained me on the P-8. So those countries are providing officers who are maritime patrol experts, transitioning them to P-8. And then so we're are, are trading uh, tactics and, uh, and communicating all this uh, and whenever we go to exercises like we just went to and, to and talking to them about it, we didn't have a P-8 there for this exercise, but in other exercises we do have P-8s. We had P-8s at Valiant Shield and at RIMPAC. When our, uh, when our coalition partners come and see the capabilities of the P-8 and they, they ride along and they see what we're able to do, that just furthers because we want everyone to be a, a part of the group. If we have to fight a fight, we, ought, we want to be uh, going to do it together. Are you guys going to still maintain some form of overland capability as well? Because time and time again, even though it's said that, okay, you guys are going to start focusing purely on the anti-submarine warfare mission, there are P-3s that are still serving in overland capacities all over the world. I think because of the capability, if we have the sensor capability, we'll never completely divest of being able to go overland, but it's not our primary mission, and it's not what we primarily train to. But if asked to do something like that, uh, you know, we're going to be prepared whether we're off the coast or overland if we had to. But it's not what we're, uh, it's not what we're designed to do, and it's not what, uh, what we're trained primarily to do. Let me ask you, um, you know, we come from the other Washington where Budget Control uh, Act has been sort of a primary question. Um, you know, you guys are operating an older airframe here. Uh, almost everybody has felt on the pointy end of the spear some implications from the Budget Control Act. How has that affected you guys uh, out here, whether in terms of training, whether in terms of operations, whether in terms of, of maintenance? So that, that's interesting. Anytime there's a, a, a budget crunch, and there usually is one going on at about this time, we need to closely look at uh, our funding for our flight hours, for our maintenance, and for our uh, temporary duty to send guys to those exercises where they get the best training. Uh, I will say that we always keep safety as our number one priority. We don't let that, uh, we don't compromise that in any way uh, while we're while we're dealing with this, and we uh, we take a, a very uh, uh, close look when uh, when we're uh, when we're looking at budget questions. Uh, 
And if, you know, it looks like now the Budget Control Act is going to be lifted. Mm -hmm. uh, Republican leadership has talked about it. Obviously, uh, President-elect Trump has talked about scrapping the Budget Control Act. Uh, if uh, Admiral Richardson were to call you and say, Captain, on your top three requirements, I'm going to give you more money. What would you spend that more, you know, what would you spend more money on? What would be on your priorities list? Uh, it would be uh, flight hours for my people. It would be uh, TEMAD funding. And it would be the parts that we need to sustain our airplanes. I know the uh, the P-8 right now is running into some shortfalls for certain parts. Uh, so when you give the people the flight hours they need so that they feel comfortably trained to safely do what they can do, the, the TDY money so that they can execute those exercises, and the parts so that the planes are up and available, I think that's uh, that's what you need. Um, what are the biggest challenges for operating an airplane that's that's this old? Um, even though it's a very, very robust airplane, it also has certain maintenance peculiarities, things with the wing, for example, that you mm -hmm. can and can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, for its robustness, it does have some very delicate features about it because of its machined wing and a couple of other things. You know, what are some of the unique challenges of keeping the airplane flying? So uh, when I came to the community, we had the red stripe, and we had uh, few airplanes for the entire wing. Now we're in an interesting situation where, because of the drawdown, we have more airplanes than uh, we've had in the past. So keeping those airplanes up with the same number of maintainers has been interesting, uh, a challenge. When I say interesting, I mean a challenge. Uh, and uh, it really is uh, uh, better than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be uh, much more challenging. but. It's, uh, you know, our greatest asset, our people, our greatest weapon system, our people, and they have done a fantastic job of keeping those planes flying. When I was in, uh, during the, uh, the last exercise, we executed 71 out of 71 events. Um, we didn't miss an event, and that's, uh, that was on the backs of our people. Uh, are you measurably getting better at, at finding and tracking subs? I would say from... 2009 when I joined the community to now and over the course of uh, my career I would say yes we are we are getting that skill back because we're emphasizing it in the right way and uh, and people recognize that you know the biggest threat to the Navy and you can read any article uh, or interview from the CNO all the way up uh, is anti-submarine warfare and I think we're getting better at uh, at uh, countering that threat. The Navy has made this an enterprise-wide priority, and Admiral Connor, uh, who is the former commander of the submarine force, would talk about the Navy team approach, mm -hmm. that all of the different, you know, the anti-submarine enterprises, not just yeah. aircraft, not just submarines and surface ships, but sure. everybody working together yeah. in order to make that, make that happen. How are you working more closely? Yeah. You know, are you getting rides on subs to get a sense on, mm -hmm. you know, from an undersea perspective what it is? And even though you're an aviator and a vaunted and a legendary aviator, mm -hmm. you know, do you, do you go aboard surface ships also in order to, to get, uh, that's, that's just a joke on the, <laughs> So that's a great question. Uh, actually, yeah, they reached out to me last week to go on a submarine ride next week. Unfortunately, I had to refuse because on Sunday I'm taking off for the Middle East to visit uh, uh, my squadrons VP-1 and VQ-1 that are flying out there, and they'll be there over the uh, holidays. So I'm going to go out there for a week and fly with them and see how they're doing. Uh, during the last exercise, I realized that in our training, we need to ch change the way we train and fight to the high-end threat. And we don't need to relearn these lessons as we do these exercises, as we get the battle groups ready. And I had the, the Deseron commanders for the next two strike groups sitting next to me by the end of the week so that they could see what we were learning with the Deseron and the strike group stra staff for the Carl Vinson strike group. So that's kind of, uh, you know, you don't have to take part in the, uh, in the exercise to learn some of the lessons, and, uh, and those are uh, surface uh, warriors. And uh, I was in a, a VTC the other day with the uh, Deseron, the, with the Theodore Roosevelt Deseron, and I was briefing anti-surface and anti-submarine warfare from a, a maritime patrol perspective with all the COs of the ships from Hawaii and San Diego. That's the kind of learning that we need to encourage, I think, uh, so that it makes it easier for us. So once we start flying together, uh, it's much more seamless. I don't have to spend the first week of a two-week exercise ramping up uh, to, to get to a, a, a place where we can uh, fight together. 
Um, and, and the whole force, and I was just joking earlier, I mean, I was, I, was, I, was, I was purely kidding, because everybody is working really hard on what is an exceptionally hard problem to solve. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the surface community has been focused on it for some time as, as well. Um, as you look at the challenge, though, um, anti-submarine warfare is a very distributed game, it's a very challenging game, and it is a very complex evolution from national intelligence means to patrol aircraft to the submarines and then the surface units that will prosecute it. And that depends on a communications net. As you're looking for um, the future environment, which until recently the Navy was calling anti-access area denial, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the event that a potential adversary is denying us these communications means, are we thinking through, or as a commander, are you satisfied that that those kind of complex handoffs among the key forces of the anti-submarine enterprise are going to be able to communicate with one another? So as a commander of, uh, of our forces here, I'm never satisfied with uh, the way we communicate because it can always be better. That's one of the biggest challenges, I think, is when you're in the battle space, in the fog of war, it's hard to communicate uh, across, the, uh, across the strike group and in the maritime patrol force and ensure that everyone has the same message. Uh, what I am comfortable with is if we are in an area where we're not able to communicate, our crews, they will go out by themselves and they will execute the commander's intent. So if they find a submarine uh, and they know the uh, rules of engagement, and commander's intent, they will find and track, and if told to, uh, kill that submarine. And so they don't need to be communicating with anyone uh, if they have the commander's intent and the rules of engagement or or, uh, authorize that. One of the things that has happened with the force, which is something we haven't done since Cold War days, is to um, use them as strategic messaging. For example, the P-8 aircraft, when it was over in the South China Sea, Mm -hmm. to sort of contest China's claims. Uh, when it comes to these freedom of navigation operations, that puts the onus, you know, obviously on the crews, obviously they're cleared from a very, very high level, but these um, exercises have been ramping up in, in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, in terms of that important strategic messaging by the United States, how does that change how crews are trained, prepared, how they're thinking about their missions when, you know, it's always high stakes, but that adds an extra measure of stakes when you're taking uh, an American aircraft over international waters that's contested? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, it's what we uh, train our crews to do. And this is why it's so challenging to take a, an airplane out as a mission commander, as a, a senior lieutenant, 30 year old uh, officer, and to be in charge of that mission. And to answer that question, if you're queried by uh, a, a, another country, you need to have the right answer. You need to be able to have the right response. And that is why commander's intent. I can't be in the aircraft with the, those guys and gals who are flying those airplanes, so they need to understand uh, how to react appropriately. Uh, a very challenging problem, and, uh, but uh, I feel very comfortable the way our people respond. The Chief of Naval Operations has made um, high-velocity learning, mm-hmm. rapid learning, innovation as yes. our priorities. Um, you know, what is, you know, as somebody who is uh, the commander of such a large force, mm-hmm. what does that mean for you? And what, is it, what, it, what are you doing in order to be able to sort of execute that, harvest good ideas, and create this sort of uh, dialogue? I mean, the Navy has always been, and, and the entire U.S. military has always been a rapid learning adaptive force. Mm-hmm. But the CNO is trying to give it a push to move even faster, to be more open to ideas. How has that changed how you're doing business here at, uh, at Group 10? So we are always looking for new ideas. And you have to be very open, I think, as the, as the person in charge. You need to uh, have a, a welcoming environment and encourage people, who, junior people, who have some great ideas to be able to speak up. If they feel like they can't speak up, uh, then you're not going to get that high-velocity learning. You're not going to get those ideas. You're not going to get you know, the high-velocity learning that just in the past couple months since I've been in charge, uh, those Deseron commanders sitting next to you, the software applications that we can use that have information that will change the way we fight. Uh, we have the ability to, to use those uh, high-velocity learning examples. Uh, and it just happens because you, we are not uh, satisfied with the status quo. When you're not satisfied with the status quo, 
those HVL examples happen because people will come to you with good ideas on how to change the way we fight in a positive manner. So what are so what would be a good example uh, of one of the good ideas that you know your junior folks have um, you know brought up that you've embraced? So one of the uh, good examples for, of high velocity learning from one of my junior folks is uh, doing flight assessments. We have the wing staff flying on the with the crews when they're getting their qualifications. They are able to provide real time feedback to the crews uh, at that time, and then we can come back and discuss it. Where in the past those crews were going out and they were we were providing an assessment based on their report of the uh, of the flight. And so this uh, real-time assessment on the plane and then when they get back is uh, a great example of uh, high-velocity learning. It was from our, uh, ju- one of our junior lieutenants. And, uh, and one last question. So what are the things uh, that you're going to miss about the P3, and what are the things you are really not going to miss about the P3 when it goes away? Uh, so what am I going to miss about the, P- the P3 is just it's kind of nostalgic, and uh, you feel comfortable because it's got such a, a great – our uh, reliability record, you knew when you were getting in that airplane, it was going to take you home. One of the things I'm not going to miss about the P3 is getting shaken for eight hours. uh, Because after you do that for eight hours, you want to take a nap. uh, (laughs) And you don't have that same, uh, uh, it doesn't have that same effect flying the P8. P8 is wonderful inside the airplane. And and you're not going to miss the head? Uh, no, I'm not going to miss the head either in the, P, in the P3. <laughs> sir, thanks very much for taking all this time with us. We really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. 